Hi, my name is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share easy to understand evidence-based holistic insights to help you master the game of building wealth. And thank you for sending all your questions and feedback. You can send me any questions to questions at investopoly.com.au. That's the email address. And of course, if you're willing to leave a rating or review on the podcast platform that you listen to, that would be greatly appreciated as always. So let's get into today's episode, and it's a two-part series. I'm going to go through part one today, next week, obviously cover off on part two, which is about wrap accounts, which is a topic that many listeners have asked me to cover in detail. But to set the scene, part one's really about how to invest your super, and of course, lots of Australians are very interested in making sure their super is invested widely. In fact, I'd say that probably over the last 10 years, there's been greater engagement with this. Most people really just kind of ignored superannuation historically. But I think we're all becoming a little bit more educated to say, hey, it's relatively easy to make sure that we're in the right place in terms of superannuation, that we're minimizing fees, maximizing returns. And so what I wanted to do is kind of set the scene in this part one of this series is talk about what are your options? And of course, there's been a lot of criticism with industry super funds lately, particularly with regard to the role and influence of unions, particularly as a result of the CMFEU going into administration, which is, you know, made headlines around Australia over the last few weeks. But also there's been commentary also from myself around the oversight and transparency around unlisted investments as well, and some question marks there. Quite often people think establishing their own self-managed super fund is a way to gain greater control and transparency over their investments. I mean, that is true, but nowadays there's a lot more cost-effective ways to do that that don't come with all the administration and compliance hassles. So that's what I wanted to cover is what are these options? And then we'll do a deep dive next week into superannuation wrap accounts. What are they? How do they suit people? And then in what circumstances would you consider using a wrap account? Now, as you know, each year I record an episode, write a blog about looking at returns for the financial year just passed from the top eight industry super funds. Now, typically, I've excluded retail super funds just because they, they tended to not be competitive, you know, both in terms of fees and returns. And 20 years ago, the big retail funds like AMP, Colonial First State, MLC really dominated the superannuation market. You know, they had a, a much greater market share than what they did today. Unfortunately, they tend to be very costly and delivered, you know, pretty ordinary investment returns partly because they were paying commissions to financial advisors and because they were a little bit under on the nose, that's what sort of led to the growth in the industry super fund sector. But back in 2019, the Australian government banned financial advisors from receiving commissions off investment products. Easily the best move the government's ever made. And that's not difficult because most of their decisions in this space have been absolutely horrible, but that was a no brainer and probably should have been done sort of decades ago, but it certainly changed the landscape and therefore forced retail funds to start become more competitive, which they've been working on over the last sort of five-ish years or so. And now what we're starting to see is green shoots of real competition in this space, which is fantastic because it's going to keep these industry super funds honest. So let's talk about the industry super funds because that's your first option. And, you know, they do a lot of advertising on TV, would all be familiar with industry super funds. And the proposition is that they're not for profit, that they're there to serve members, that they're a not for profit business. And that's great, although they're also not for productivity as well. So if you have a look at the fees charged back in 2013, so that's what that nine, uh, sorry, 11 years ago, the average fee charged by industry super funds was 1.07% just a little more than 1%. Today, that's decreased to 1%. Now, that might sound like good news, but really that's pretty poor. Because if you have a look at how much was invested in industry super funds back in 2013, there was $356 billion invested. That figure has more than tripled over the last 11 years to $1.2 trillion dollars. So an increase of 11.4% in terms of the balances, the amount of money that's been invested in industry funds. Now, 
The population over that time, however, has only increased by 1.4%. So whilst they're essentially the, the number of members that they've got, which is really a big driver around cost, because the more people, more accounts you look after, more phone calls you get, et cetera, et cetera. But really the population's sort of barely changed over that period of time, but the money invested has substantially changed. And so when you look at the fees that they've generated, back in 2013, industry super funds charged $3.8 billion in fees. Today, that figure is a balloon to $12 billion. Now, of course, it's going to cost more money to look after more money. You know, they had $356 billion 11 years ago, $1.2 trillion today. Of course, it costs more to look after that, but certainly not three times more. It's similar from a financial planning perspective to look after a portfolio that has a million dollars in it or $3 million, a little bit of extra work for the $3 million portfolio. And certainly there's sort of higher risk. You want to spend a little bit more time on it, but it's not three times as much. In fact, I would say maybe it's 20% or 30% more time given the change in size. So you should achieve some economies of scale, but charging $12 billion in fees certainly isn't delivering on that economies of scale. And that's why I say that it's in urgent need, the industry super fund sector is in an urgent need of better productivity and achieve some economies of scale. It's great that they're not for profit, so they're not out to make a commercial profit, but there's got to be a stronger focus on productivity that is reducing the fees particularly given the tremendous free kick they've got from the rising superannuation guarantee rate. You know, over that period of time, it's gone from so 9 to 12%. So even just because of the mandated employer contributions, they're receiving a lot more money. Problem is that they're spending that money on fees, on, you know, employing more people. And the issue is that the unions appoint at least one third of di directors, and I would say have influence probably over the other third, which is what's called member representatives. So really those boards are controlled by the unions. And we know that unions aren't typically known for their focus on productivity. In fact, their mandate typically is the more people that are employed, the better. So I'm not optimistic of, you know, that changing anytime soon. What we really do need is competition from other sectors of the market. The other thing to be really aware of as well, and I think it's good to be realistic about these things, the other problem the industry super funds have is that their average account balance is just below $100,000, which is not a small amount of money, of course, I don't want to be flagrant about it, but relative in superannuation, it's a relatively small balance. So you've got millions of members with very small balances, and that's costly to look after. And as a consequence of that, they have to charge then percentage-based fees because you can't charge someone with a balance of say $50,000. You can't charge them $5,000 a year to run their account, even though it might cost you that probably doesn't cost that much, but just to sort of make the point. The problem then is we're going to have higher percentage-based fee costs in an industry super fund environment, which is fine for those with lower balances, but penalizes, unduly penalizes those with higher balances. It's because of the environment, you've got many accounts, low balances. It's not a good environment for people that have more than half a million dollars of super because as your balance grows, so do the dollar value of your fees to a point where it doesn't become very competitive at all and you don't get to achieve any economies of scale within your account, which you can do in other environments. So industry super funds, yeah, certainly there's some positives associated with it, but really they do need more productivity in that environment. So your next option is what's called retail super funds. And these are really for-profit businesses, if you like. Since 2015, the retail super fund markets lost about 30% market share mostly it's gone to the industry super funds. And they've fallen out of favour really because, as I said, they were relatively uncompetitive, you know, going back a decade or more ago, just a terrible environment for super. High fees, you know, fees about 1% or more, and the returns typically not so great. The largest retail super fund providers now are firms called Insignia, which is the formerly IOOF, AMP, Colonial First State, and MRSA. They're the really big ones of those names. If you recognize any of those names, you can get an idea of who I'm talking about. Now, a 
big change happened a couple of years ago. Vanguard, as you would know, I talk about Vanguard a lot in this podcast. They're the largest index fund manager in the world. They used to run a lot of portfolios for the industry super funds. So they would run those portfolios for a cost, of course, and that used to be you know, a fair chunk of Vanguard's business in Australia. Well, a few years ago, Vanguard sacked all those funds, so sacked all those clients because it wanted to launch its own superannuation product. And it did that at the end of 2022. And just recently, the funds invested in that product surpassed $1 billion, which is a relatively modest amount in the superannuation industry. You know, it's relatively small. It's a blip on the radar, really. But it is important point, I guess, it's starting to accumulate quite a lot of funds. And importantly, Vanguard is a not-for-profit business also. It's a mutual entity that's owned by the investors. So it's got a solid track record, unlike the industry funds, of achieving scale and reducing fees. In fact, Vanguard reduced its fees on its super product in Australia only just a couple of months ago. So it's really demonstrating that already, even though it's only accumulated a billion dollars, it's already been able to sort of pass on those fee reductions. But if you have a look in the US where there's a much longer history, they've proactively over time reduced fees and they've got a really strong focus on productivity and making sure the product sort of stands on its own two feet. And when you have a look at the fees that Vanguard Super charges, they are also very competitive. I compared them to Unisuper, which is the industry fund that I recommend, or at least back in July when I did the analysis, that was my conclusion back then. And so on a balance of $150,000, you'd pay just over $1,000 with Unisuper in terms of admin and investment fees. With Vanguard Super, it's $840. On a balance of $450, you pay just over $3,000 with Unisuper versus $2,100 with Vanguard Super. So the fee differential is quite significant. Now, before you jump ship and leave leave your industry super fund and go to Vanguard Super, which I wouldn't suggest you do, at least not at this stage. There's two considerations why we wouldn't do that. The first one is the product is relatively new. As I said, launch end of 2022. Now, of course, it invests in funds that have been around for a long time, many decades. You know, it invests in Vanguard Australia, which is a managed fund that, that started in 1997. So it's been around for a long period of time. So I'm not too concerned really about investment performance per se, but of course, new products always encounter teething problems. And I prefer to see a product have a strong track record before recommending it because there could be a lot of other problems with the fund they need to sort of iron out. The second concern is that all funds are invested in traditional market cap indexing. And I've talked about that in previous episodes, specifically episode 313, which is entitled Four Alternative Rules-Based Indexing Strategies that I published on the 17th of July. So I talk about there, you know, how the different strategies perform differently and that are appropriate to use in different geographical markets. So go and have a listen to that episode. I plan to include Vanguard Super in my analysis next year. So in late July, early August next year in 2025, by that time, it'll have two and a half years of history and I will include it when I compare the industry super funds. Let's see what conclusion I arrive at at that stage. We're also spending a lot more time sort of learning more about the product, its functionality, all those sorts of things. So by that point, hopefully I'll be in a position to be able to tell you whether I think it is superior than the industry super fund. Certainly on a fee alone basis, it is. Let's see what about the rest of the product, including other things like insurances and so forth, which a lot of people have inside super. Okay, so we've talked about industry super funds as an option. We've talked then about retail super funds. I should say with retail super funds, beta shares is looking to get into that market as well. So I think there's going to be, you know, the sign is we've got Vanguard beta shares, the sign is that there's going to be a lot more competition from retail super funds, which is great because it creates another viable option as an alternative to industry super funds. And hopefully it keeps those industry super funds a little bit more honest. Let's talk about self-managed super now. So prior to July 2016, a lot of accountants were able to recommend their clients establish a self-managed super fund. Now they changed those laws. Now an accountant needs to have an Australian financial services license to do 
that. And consequently, the number of self-managed super funds is in decline. And that's actually, I think, a good decision because what was happening, not necessarily in every situation, of course, but what was happening is accounts would go, yeah, yeah, establish a self-managed super fund. They would then be able to charge a fee to set it up and then look after it ongoing. Unfortunately, the people that established were then left with the decision of, okay, what am I going to do with the money? And when you have a look at all the data, self-managed super funds tend to hold a lot of cash just because there's some inertia there with respect to making investment decisions. So in that situation, the person would probably better off just being an industry fund, at least then being fully invested over that period of time. So I don't think it was a good decision in terms of making sure that people are fully informed. In terms of fees, you know, you've got to deal with all the compliance matters and costs and so forth. And typically, you're going to pay between three to seven thousand dollars a year to run a self-managed super fund. Now there are some really low cost providers out there. You just want to be careful with those sorts of things. If you're going to do it, do it properly. And you want to be able to have a point of call, you know, a professional that you can speak to about your self-managed super fund to get some specific advice around it. And so look, I don't I think if you've got a self-managed super and it's very, very simple. Okay, maybe those low cost options could suit you. But if you've got a lot of money in the self-managed super fund, you want to make sure you're really making the most out of it. And that low cost option might not be appropriate. So really three to $7,000, of course, it depends on what's in the fund and how complex it is. In my view, the only reason to establish a self-managed super fund is if you want to invest in unlisted assets. Now, the common unlisted assets that you might see people invest their super in, direct property, so residential commercial property, or sometimes unlisted commercial property funds. They tend to be the most common ones. Now, if you don't want to invest in either of those sorts of assets, then the chances are a self-managed super fund isn't the right option for you. That in fact, either a wrap platform that's going to give you a lot of flexibility or a retail fund or an industry fund is probably going to be a better solution for you. Okay, so we talked about industry funds, retail funds, and self-managed super funds. The last option you've got is what's called a wrap platform or wrap product. Now, a lot of people find it difficult to really understand what a wrap platform is or wrap product is. And maybe I can use an analogy. Let's use the analogy of visiting a buffet, you know, a buffet restaurant. In a restaurant, you've got a wide selection of food. It's all in one place, which means you can select the bits that you like and skip the bits that you don't really want. The restaurant takes care of everything, including the cooking and serving and cleaning up. And when you're done, you pay a sort of single bill, regardless of how much you've eaten. A wrap platform works in a similar way. It sets up a super account that's just in your name. Provider looks after all the compliance, tax, returns, reporting, administration, all that sort of work. The wrap provider usually gives you a very broad investment menu, meaning you can invest in direct shares, most ETFs, and typically between three to 600 managed funds, so very, very broad investment menu and options. And that gives you the full transparency and control of how you invest those monies without the administrative headaches and cost of running a self-managed super fund. And so next week, I'm going to take a deep dive in part two on how RAP platforms work, what are all the advantages, both from an investment perspective and taxation, what are the disadvantages, what are the costs, and what are the common scenarios in which I think using a RAP platform might make sense. And then I'm going to sum it all up to give you some clear direction of when you might use a industry or retail fund, when a wrap product might suit you better, or when a self-managed super fund is the right way to go. And hopefully after listening to that second part, you'll have a much broader understanding of what your options are and which ones are probably going to suit you best. Okay, let's get into some listener questions now. And the first listener question I'll take from Eric. He's got two questions, in fact. So the first of Eric's questions is, when would you make additional super contributions compared to investing outside of super? For example, for a self-employed person that has $30,000 of surplus cash, I'm assuming they would be better off putting that into super and claiming a tax deduction rather than investing it directly in the share market. Obviously, this is assuming we are holding the shares until retirement. In this scenario, would you directly invest in the share market instead of super? like to know your thoughts on this. So good question, Eric. What are the situations in which I wouldn't first make those contributions and invest in super? 
So I think you'd do that up to the concessional cap. It's a different question than if you had more than $30,000, where do you put the money then? So when wouldn't I make those or be attracted to making concessional contributions and investing it there? Well, I think if your super balance is already you know, at an average level or above average level, you know, I might start to look to investing outside super to give me a little bit more flexibility. But if your super balance is relatively low for your age, then I certainly would focus on making additional super contributions. If you wouldn't get a huge benefit from making concessional contributions, so that is a huge tax benefit. Now that's going to be rare because most people, even if their income's over $250,000 and they pay for what's called Div 293, tax, even they're going to be 17% better off by making concessional contributions. But I, I would also be driven by the sort of tax benefits associated with that. If I definitely wanted to use the funds before retirement, I wouldn't put it inside super. So particularly, you know, for younger people, you do want to maximize contributions, but also you want to have that balance between having the flexibility as well. And the fourth scenario I thought about was maybe if the client had a high level of debt, particularly if it's non-tax deductible debt, so they're high Home loan. Sometimes I would prefer to see debt reduction over and above super contributions, but I would probably loop that back to, you know, what is their super balance relative to their age and where we hope or expect it to be. But as a general rule, I would say most of the time, you know, if you had a surplus 30 grand of cash, yeah, make a personal concessional contribution, claim a tax action for it and invest it in that environment. Okay, Eric's second question, he writes, I've been listening to your podcast since 2018, and I'm not sure if you've ever discussed the concept of debt recycling. Would you ever consider using a strategy for your clients? For example, if someone had a home loan for $500,000 against their principal place of residence and say had $200,000 in the offset account, would you consider paying down the home loan and redrawing to invest in shares? That way it would generate dividends and distributions that you could use to pay down the home loan and whilst the redraw is actually tax deductible. And then you can rinse and repeat the strategy if that works. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, so what Eric's asking is really borrowing to invest. And therefore, if you do that, you've got then more investment income. The problem with that is your assumption is that you don't have the interest cost, that you're either going to capitalize that, so borrow the interest cost, or you've ignored it. Whereas if I go and invest in the share market, maybe I'll get sort of three and a half, four percent in terms of income and realized capital gains throughout a year in terms of a long-term return. But my borrowing costs are probably six percent. So that's negatively gearing because my investment income is less than my interest costs, which is great. I can claim a tax suction for that, of course, so it's tax effective, but it's not really going to help me repay my home loan sooner. The only way it's going to help me repay my home loan sooner is if I borrow the interest cost. So for example, if I had a line of credit, I draw $100,000. The line of credit limit is say $200,000. I draw the $100,000. I get charged $6,000 of interest over the next 12 months. And I just use the line of credit. I just let the interest accumulate. So at the end of that year then, I owe $106,000 and that's what's called capitalizing interest. And that's the way that in that situation, then you've got the cash flow from the investments, which you definitely can put towards repaying your home loan. But in return for that, you then got a higher level of debt against the investment portfolio. But the point is that my interest cost still outweighs my income unless I'm getting more than 6% or 7% in terms of income. And so I'm going backwards. It's a strategy that I've seen advertised or talked about by some of the large financial advice businesses like MLC or so forth. I think they had a flyer with it. I don't really, it doesn't really make sense to me, right? I mean, it might make sense as an investment strategy, but not as a way to repay your home loan sooner. I just don't see how that happens when it's actually negative cash flow rather than positive cash flow. The other thing with your question, Eric, is that you would never mix purposes. So in your situation, maybe this wasn't your intent with the question, but in your situation, but I should clarify it. In your situation, what you're saying is you've got a home loan with that's 500,000 with 200,000 in the offset. Pay the 200,000 into the home loan and then redraw the money out for investment purposes. Now you could certainly do that, but you'd never mix purposes because then you'd have, you know, a loan that relates to both the home and the investment. In that situation, what you do is take the 200, pay down the home loan, go to the bank, ask for a brand new investment loan for $200,000. And that way you're splitting 
those two out. The, the reason for that is that you want to separately account for interest rather than using a spreadsheet, which can become messy. But most importantly, the ATO says when you make a repayment against the loan, you have to apportion that repayment across multiple purposes, which means then you can't just repay your home loan. You've then got to notionally repay both the investment portion and the home loan if it's mixed in one account. So certainly don't do that from that strategy. Now, Eric, just for the sake of listeners, if I can reframe your question to something different that's not really focused at repaying your home loan sooner, but really about using gearing to invest. So given the same situation, which means I've got a lot of cash in my offset account, 200,000, I've got a relatively low net home loan balance of 300,000. I don't know the income and those sorts of things, but in that situation, certainly it looks like that person has the capacity to be able to borrow to invest. Now, whether that borrowing to invest will help them repay their home loan sooner is a completely different question. As I said, I don't think it will. But would I do that in that situation? Yeah, I probably would. I think it would make sense. I mean, not in every situation, you know, you've got to use borrowings carefully, of course, but that person certainly has the capacity to be able to, to use some of those borrowings to invest. I just probably wouldn't do it when markets are all-time highs. And currently, markets are at all-time highs. So I'd be conservative about the amount of borrowings I'm using to invest in the market. But if the market was to crash, for instance, and drop 30%, as I've talked about this in this podcast previously, yeah, I would start thinking about, well, maybe I can deploy some of those cash savings into the market in a tax effective way that, you know, I can negatively gear, but also I know it's a good time to enter into the market. But great question. I actually recorded a video on YouTube about this debt recycling and just trying to knock that on the head in terms of the miscommunication around it, in terms of it being a strategy to help you repay your home. It used to be, I mean, if you think back a couple of years ago when we could go and borrow at 2% or 2.5%, bang, absolutely, it's going to work because, you know, the dividend yield is going to be greater than the interest cost, in which case I've increased my cash flow and it would help me repay my home loan sooner. But those days are gone unfortunately, and I don't think they're going to return anytime soon. Okay, so I'm conscious of time, don't want to go over half an hour. Uh, I hope that's been enjoyable. I look forward to sharing part two with you next week for an interesting discussion about RAP platform products. And as I said at the start, I'd greatly appreciate if you left a rating or review on the podcast platform that you use, that would be tremendous. And until next week, bye for now.